our scripture reading for today. Let us all turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 to 11. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 to 11 says, David again brought, to brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set up from Balak of Judah, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of, the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzziah and Ohio, son of Abinadab, were guarding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ohio was walking in front of it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs and with harps, lyre, timbrels, systems, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Narcon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the Ark of God, because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irrelevant act. Therefore God struck him down, and he died there beside the Ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken up against Uzziah, and to this day, that place is called Perez Uzziah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the Ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the Ark of the Lord to be with him in, in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The Ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. This is the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Welcome to the house of God on the blessed day of the Lord. And I believe uh, that just being here today to seek the Lord, He will bless you and He will hear your prayers. Is it well with you? Is it well? It is well. Would you rather choose to be well? It is to say it is well because my relationship with God is good right now, even though my bank account is minus, even though I am not feeling well physically, uh, health-wise, even though there are many troubles in my life, can we say it is well because my relationship with God is good? Yes. Or would you rather forget about the relationship with God and get your bank account up on the positive again? and healthy again, and all things well. You don't say both, don't say both. Which one would we rather have? Can we say, can we really say, it is well? You know, this, is from, uh, this song is inspired from a hymn, right? When, uh, when he sighed the river, right? And he had, the, the author of that hymn uh, had lost his children, his wife was uh, dying, and he was on the way uh, to, and he lost his business, he went bankrupt, and he lost his children on a shipwreck, right? And then uh, his wife was in trouble, so he was on his way to see his wife, or, or was, was she already dead? Anyway, he was in big trouble, but on the way, Looking at the waves of the sea, he said, it is well with me, because the Lord is in control. Is it well with you today? <laughs> Today's sermon is, the, is just the opposite. And the title is, Unjustified Death, with a question mark. Elder has read about a day when David had planned uh, as he was fighting all kinds of battles, as he was uh, unifying the kingdom, as he was building up the city of David, it was supposed to be the city of, of, of city for God. He was doing all these for this day, we can even say. The day when he can bring the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, back to Israel. Because during the time of King Saul, the Ark of the Covenant had gone missing. It was lost to the Philistines. And the Philistines realized, having that Ark of the Covenant that the Israelites used to use as a lucky charm, 
Every time they came out to the battle, they brought the Ark of the Covenant, they gained victory. So that's why the Philistines took the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, but only trouble took place. People started dying of plague and everything when they had the Ark of the Covenant at the wrong place. So they returned the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant was within the borders of Israel, technically, but not in the center. So this is the day when David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant. And as today uh, we read today in verse 5, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments. This was a happy day. There was a great excitement. They had all, probably had all kinds of fireworks ready to you know, go off when the Ark of the Covenant came in. They were re getting ready to welcome the Ark of the Covenant. But what happens? A great tragedy takes place. Uzzah, who was aiding with the carrying of the Ark of the Covenant, who, uh, transporting, he gets struck by God, none other, by God to death. And that great celebration turned into a big, sad tragedy and funeral. Have you ever been in an a, uh, environment or a party or you know, birthday celebration or something? Uh, I know all of you have experienced this. Uh, hear me out. Uh, a good day is supposed to be, uh, everybody's supposed to be happy and then you're, the, the main guy, the birthday boy or your dad, you know, the, the, the oldest person in the house or the pastor comes out with a very bad mood and ruins everything. I say, you all experienced it because I've done that a few times. You know, it's supposed to be a happy day and then the pastor ruins everything, scolds and is just unhappy about something. This is the day when everybody's happy. God should be the happiest, it seems. But God is really upset. And it says, God, uh, God's outburst came upon Uzzah. This outburst, Perez, it literally means to tear up, to rip up, or to, to destroy. You can maybe imagine something, uh, some, uh, some, uh, an image you saw in a uh, movie when a person gets blown up by a grenade or something like that. You know, touch the Ark of the Covenant because, because who wouldn't? This precious Ark of the Covenant, because of the ox that upset it, meaning, you know, shook it off, it's about, it's tilting over. Wouldn't you? Right? Wouldn't you, if this thing was about to fall over, wouldn't I hold on to it? Right? But this is, this is a very precious, like a, a treasure box kind of thing. Very precious, holy Ark of the Covenant about thinking, who's that thought it's going to fall over? I need to at least hold on to it. And immediately God strikes him to death. Could he have, could God have given him a warning and maybe burn his hand or something, snap his hand, or even cut off his hand, give him a lesson? Don't ever touch my ark again. No, he didn't give a, a, a second chance. He struck him to death. No second chance. For David, that was a big warning. Of course, the, the problem was they did not follow the law in, uh, in the method of carrying the Ark of the Covenant. But we're not here, I'm not here to uh, explain about that. It's supposed to be carried on the shoulders of the descendants of Korah, descendants of Aaron. And, but they carried it in a new cart. The intention was good. So is, is Uzzah's death justified? No warning, just killed him. Let us turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 13, which tells us the same story in more detail. 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 3 and 4. It says, And let us bring back the ark of God, our God to us, 
For we did not see it in the days of Saul. This is King David speaking. Then all the assembly said they would do so, for the thing was right in their eyes of all the people. So they all they came into unanimous agreement we should bring the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. During the time of King Saul, they didn't do it. They lost it. But at least now, let us bring it back. Good intention. So shouldn't God have considered this good intention before he struck Uzzah, Uzzah to death out of his sudden hot-tempered anger and wrath, it seems? Let's skip to verses 9 through 11. 9, and, 9 to 11. First Chronicles 13, 9 through 11. When they came to the thresh, threshing floor of Kidon, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark because the oxen nearly upset it. It says nearly upset it. The anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah and he struck him down with down because he put his hand on the ark, hand to the ark. And he died there before God. Then David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and he called that place Perez Uzzah to this day. Now we can see, even David thought this death was not so justified. He says, it literally says, David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. This word outburst seems like the Lord had, had could not control his temper kind of thing. But later David repented and understood why. This word outburst, or breaking out, this word is used by God before, when God called Moses up to Mount Sinai, and he told him to go down and put a fence around the, around the bottom of Mount Sinai. Because if people c come across and climb this mountain, the holiness of the Lord might break out against them. God is putting a boundary between His holiness and our commonness. God is distinguishing His place. And so here we can, we, we, we get a hint that there was an invisible <coughs> fence that separated God's holiness and us. Uzzah broke into that. Uzzah disregarded that, uh, that div uh, separation and division. And that's why God's, God's wrath broke out against him. It's supposed to be a happy day when everyone's excited. But even then, was it fair for Uzzah? Was it fair? If, if Uzzah was your family member, or if you were Uzzah, what would you have thought? Lord, it's not fair. There are many times in our lives, not as ex extreme as this case, but when we think it's not fair, sometimes. God, I did not intend to sin, but the circumstances, the situation, I had no choice. That guy hated me first. That guy did harm against me first. I'm a weak human being. I can get angry. God, I didn't mean to be late to church. You try to have two kids or three kids and a husband and traffic. If you wanted me to be early, you should have cleared the traffic for me. Don't blame me for being late. There are other circumstances, conditions, that, that made me do this, but my intention is not. It's not because I didn't want to really get blessed through the word or through praise today. I just went through a hell today through with my boss and with my work. God, you gotta understand me. See, we these are reasonable reasons. <laughs> Rational reasons. These are logical. God, I didn't know. I didn't know. Who's that could have said? God, I didn't know. My intention was good. You gotta look at my intention. 
I'm not saying God doesn't look at our intention, but sometimes we forget about the consequences or the outcome of our actions, and we argue for our intention. God, my intention was good, but, but then this and this and this and this. So what is sin? When we think about sin, we think about what we see in the news, the crimes. You know, parents killing their children, children killing their parents, or, you know, these extreme cases. The wars, all the killings, we think about those. Something, we think about things that are clearly agreed by all mankind, whether Christians or non-Christians, as crime. We consider those sins. Things that are far-fetched, and things that we think as of right now, I would never commit that kind of thing. We define those as sinful things. However, in this circumstance, in this, uh, in this text context, and in our context, context of our life of faith, we have to think about this sin, which is very, also very scary. What is called reasonable feasibility. Have you heard that term before? It's a term that, can, that is often used in, in court trials and, and in, in, even in our life too. Reasonable. Something that is rational. Something that is explained. Something that makes sense logically. Feasibility. Something that can happen. Something that is acceptable. Possible. Right? A man commits crime. A rape. Rapes, rapes somebody. And then the lawyer says, oh, he is mentally sick. He has a mental record. Right? So it was not his intention to rape the person. It was just his body hormone, uh, something wrong with his body hormone and mental illness. So rather than getting uh, a full sentence, he gets some kind of mercy. And he serves a few years and comes back out. Reasonable feasibility. That's an extreme, extreme case. But in our life, we use that a lot. Look at uh, King Saul. Oh, before looking at King Saul, let's think about Uzzah, today's main character. What? Ark of the Covenant is about to fall down. I will put next to it so that I can guard and so that I can make sure that the Ark of the Covenant arrives at the city of David safely, what am I to do? Just watch it fall down? Isn't it reasonable for me to hold on to it? Yes. King Saul. God said to King Saul, destroy all of Amalekites. Okay. Annihilate them. Adults to children, babies, animals, kill them all. But King Saul said, I destroyed, I killed all the soldiers and I even killed the king. I destroyed Amalek. But the babies? Are you serious? Really? It's, isn't it inhumane? The animals, what did they do wrong? Right? I can, we can take them as spoils, right? Use them, turn them into money, or eat them, it will be helpful for the nation. Many people, I, have, I know many people, do not read the Old Testament because God is so inhumane as such in the Old Testament. Some people refuse to believe in God because of this. Now if God against Saul in the court, if they are fighting today, who would win? The nation of Amalek, Amalek is destroyed now. It's gone. Just as God said, destroy Amalek. <coughs> Who's the bad guy here? See, if the argument starts with hum, uh, hum, uh, humanity, human-centered idea, Saul wins. See, reasonable feasibility based upon humanity. 
I'm not speaking against humans. But humanity as opposed to God-centeredness. In th this context, and we have learned, because of that, the Amalekites revived later and gave more trouble to the Israelites. That's why knowing them, knowing them, God said, destroy them all. Dry up the sea. But because Saul did not obey, later the Israelites suffered because of that. See, this argument, reasonable visibility or humanity argument, human-centered argument, touches, it uses what is called sympathy. It becomes, the argument becomes sympathetic. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I understand. I understand. It could have been. Yes. Because I'm a human being, if you tell, come and tell me your reasons, I will say, yes, I understand. That doesn't mean God understands. What about Judas Iscariot? He said to the woman who was breaking the alabaster vial of expensive perfume, about a, year, a year's, at minimum a year's worth of wage, in that little perfume bottle. She broke it and washed Jesus' feet. Judas, looking at that, said, it would have been great if you had sold it, turned it, turned it into money, and helped the poor. Who makes better sense to be honest, logically? Jesus said, leave her alone. But then Judas Iscariot, he was in charge of the treasure box, and they were going under. Minus. No money. And waste that thing? It would have been great if she had sold it and given Jesus the money as an offering. Don't you think so? I agree. At Kadesh Barnea, when the Israelites came to, to Rithma and God said, Go in and take Canaan. What did they say? God. It is more reason, reasonable and rational for us to send, out, send in the spies and find out what the land is like, what's the situation, so we can make strategy in going in, rather than just foolishly, and they didn't say that, rather than just going in without knowing anything. After spying out, they sent, out, sent in 12 spies. After spying out for 40 days, they came back we know the story, 10 verses 2, right? 10 people said, these people are huge. They're all walking, they're all Shaquille O'Neal's walking around. Am I outdating myself here? <laughs> the, how can we ever fight against these people? Huh? Just their grape, one bunch of grapes. We, it, it requires two of us to carry it. Those guys, Take it and eat it like that. <coughs> the whole the rest of the people of Israel listen to whom? The ten or the two? Listen to the ten because it's more logical. It's more they're more rational. It seems like they care for us. They don't want us to die. But these two crazy. Their argument is weak. They don't disagree. They watch, they saw the same thing. They said, yes, those people are big. But if God is we are if God is pleased with us, He will help us. See, this, that's an if. And God, I mean, who knows? That's, what, what rational is, is there? Being found, what, what rational foundation is there? You're taking a guess. What if God doesn't help us? What's more real to us? God, invisible God, or the visible Shaquille O'Neal's waiting for you to kill, to kill you? That's rationality, that's reason. I'm not saying don't be rational. We want to be rational people. But fighting against these people, arguing against these people, you cannot defeat them. You cannot win over that kind of rationality and reasonable uh, feasibility. 
but that is because they have not experienced God's power. That is because this argument that I'm giving you as a, as a sample is without any, any, any of faith component. Here, the question is, how much faith do you add on to your argument? We are believing in Jesus, we are believing in God, who is Spirit. And when we, are, when we think about things in, re, in regards to what God is telling us to do, in regards to our life of faith, we need to ask ourselves, how much percent of my argument depends on faith? How many percent depends on human experience? What is sin here? The sin here is not knowing God, not believing God. Where is the center? What's the foundation of your argument? Human? The world? Human rationales? The, what, what is the reason why you lose faith today? What is the reason why you become dark in your faith? What is the reason why you get offended at church? What is the reason why it is you have doubts about your faith, about Jesus Christ? Is it because is it because things are not going well in terms of serving God? Or is it because I get offended? The question is, who's the center of my life of faith? Who's the center? Who needs to be pleased here in this service? Me or God? In my life of faith, whose purpose are we supposed to serve? Me? My purpose? What's the end result? Apostle Paul, before he became Paul, what was his name? Saul, right? After he met Jesus, God gave him a new name, Paul. Right? That change was not just a name change. The change was in the center. Who was the center? When he was Saul, although he was very religious, Although he claimed that he was the greatest believer of God, the center was himself. His own success in the church, his own success in the society, his recognition, his own zeal to do God's work. But when he became Paul, the center was Jesus Christ. When he was Saul, the center was I. When he became Paul, the center was J. Can we go from I to J? But if, if my, uh, my center is I acting like it's J, our actions might change for a while, but later it will come back to I. The transition that needs to take place in our life of faith is from I to J. What's the center of my life? God, I cannot do this because I have this. I might. When we argue it, we argue with I as the center, my situation, my circumstance. I'm not saying God is so cold and, and so, so cold-blooded that He doesn't care about our, our situations. He does. That's why He came down. He knows that we cannot come up to heaven, so He came down to us to reach out to us. He does that every day in our life. But even then, our, our struggle, our walk in faith is about this, going from I to J. From my, my center, the center, me as a center, to God as a center. That's our fight. That's what God did with Abraham in his life. We learned about Abraham's life journey. Ups and downs, mistakes and, and regrets. Throughout his life, God, is, God says, move from Ur of the Chaldeans to where I will tell you to go. And then he said, come out of Haran and come to Canaan. And he went to Egypt. God brought him back to Canaan. That physical move, through that physical move and, uh, and uh, all these journeys, God wanted him to travel spiritually from his centeredness 
self-centeredness to God-centered life. And throughout this 100 year of, of his life, life journey, God finally tested and proved that Abraham had moved from self-centeredness to God-centeredness through and at Moriah. Why did God wrestle with Jacob? Even after the 20 years in, at his uncle Laban's house, all the struggles and hardships, and he experienced God's miraculous work there. But even then, Jacob realized, in the center of me, there's still I. When that great fear came, fear factor came to his life, came back to his life, called Esau, waiting for him with 400 men. This great fear came upon him, and he realized all the outward actions and facade taken away, and deep inside he realized, I still have that big eye in me. I'm doing all these things for myself only. The wrestle with God was about that. And his confession in the end, God, now you bless me. I will do whatever you tell me to do. He said, I saw the face of God. Meaning, that face of God is in me. Noah was able to find grace and favor in the eyes of God. When Joseph was being sold to Egypt, the great test was, and the reason why Joseph gained victory and was successful is because throughout all that, he did not seek for his advantage. He did not seek for his argument and defense. He did not, the reason why people blame others is to protect the I in me. Do you understand? When I say the I is not this I, the, the, the big I, me. Adam and Eve blamed each other because they wanted to protect the eye in me that serpent put, in, put into their, the center of their hearts. <laughs> but Joseph did not blame anyone because he saw God in his life, in the center of his life. Do you see God in the center of your life, controlling everything? At this time, you're, you might be wondering, what does this have to do with Uzzah's death? Please, wait a little longer. We'll get to that. I'll find my, my way back somehow. If the Word, if, the, if God is not the center of my life, we look for other reasons why we complain. Because the Word is not satisfying us, and that satisfaction without the Word is only temporary. We might do different things. We might, we might get, get emotionally high on different things, but then it will not last long because the Word, God, is not in the center of your life. And those who do not get blessed by the Word, those, those who do not invite the Word into the center of their lives, they will start complaining about other things. About the programs, about you know, how ugly the pastor is, about their voice, about many different things. But let us find the Word in the center of our lives. So here, what is Uzzah's sin then? What is Uzzah's sin? On the basis of what sin is. What is Uzzah's sin? Have you ever tried praying to God, God, just give me this, and I'll give you my life. God, allow me the blessing of wealth. Let me win this lottery. Oh, allow me this. Then I will serve. Give me some more time. Then I will serve in the church. Give me some more money. I will give you more offering. God, allow me to be successful in the future. Then I will, I will, I will be your man. I will do anything you want. Or even without condition, have you prayed, God, just let me hear your voice. Tell me. I will do whatever.
I'm not saying that prayer is wrong. I hope and pray it will be very true. But how many, how many times have we kept that promise? God, I will build you a, a great mission center. I will give you this offering if you bless me. Really. So if you don't give the offering, that means because it's because God didn't give you. God give me vision. All these are future tense. God give me wealth, then I'll give you something. Really, if God gives us really gives us that thing, are we able to give him what we promised? Are you sure you're not going to change? We cannot do it. God, tell me what to, what to do. I will obey. What if God says, go to Pharaoh? What if God says, go to your enemy and love him? Can you do that? We think about all the glorious things. God, give me power. Give me your vision. Then I will go be a... You know, be the next Billy Graham, I will be the next whatever. But then what if God says, go to the person that you hate the most and love him? Can we do that? We cannot. Let's be honest, we cannot. That's why we're still in the wilderness. Don't mistake it just because we are put into a church or into a place where we're close to the word. Like Uzzah. Uzzah was put right next to the Ark of the Covenant, a glorious place. Why? Because he was familiar with, probably because he was familiar with the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was in Abinadab's house for 20 years. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. And this Uzzah is Abinadab's son. He grew up looking at and seeing this Ark of the Covenant. Very familiar. Don't we sometimes say, I've been a Christian for how many years? I've known God for how many years? And God is expecting, if you had lived with the Ark of the Covenant with me, you should at least know me. You should at least know how to revere me. Just because we're given the privilege to share the Word of God, I'm talking about myself. Just because I've been in the church for how many years? 30, more than 30 years. Does not put me in a better place to touch or, or have a less reverence for the Word of God. What is the covenant of God today? This Bible, this Word of God is our covenant. How much reverence do we have for this Word? And we make all kinds of promises. But he's, asking, he's telling us, what about now? Faithfulness is not making me a promise that you will give $10 million or $100 million. Faithfulness is giving, even if it's just $1, giving your tithe or giving your offering today. Faithfulness is giving your 10 minutes of time each day to come to me. Rather than saying, oh, when I have a lot of time in the future, I'll give the rest of my life to you. Faithfulness is what we can do now, today. Moses wanted to serve God. But God sent him to the Midian wilderness for 40 years humbled him. And when finally God called him, he said, I'm not able. Peter said to Jesus, Peter, Jesus, never will we let you be arrested. We will go to prison and even to death with you. Jesus said, don't do that. Jesus said, you cannot do that. No, Jesus, you don't know us. Jesus said, no. Only after he actually denied Jesus, Peter was able to serve him. See, the name Uzzah means strength, ability. He used his own strength 
to hold up the, the ark of God, the spiritual power of God. What is our strength to, compared to God's strength? We think sometimes the word of God or God himself has to depend on us, has to please us. But God is saying, don't mistake me. I don't need your strength. You need mine. You don't comfort me. I comfort you. And we say, God, give me blessings like Abraham, faith like Abraham. Are we ready to give up our Isaac? It doesn't always work like that, but I'm just saying. Are we, are we depending on our strength? Are we depending on our, my ability? Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 2, in today's passage, it says, And David arose and went with all, all the people who were with him to Baal, Judah, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the, bring, bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, Hashem. By the name meaning God Himself. The very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. This Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence. What was Uzzah's faith? Oh, this is a symbolic thing. This is just a ceremony. Sometimes we don't we really treat our worship service as that. As long as I'm, I have my heart. This outward thing, not so. You know, we we come up when we come up to this pulpit, we take off our shoes and put on the slippers that are dedicated for the pulpit. And some people don't understand why. We consider this place as the presence of God because the Word of God is being proclaimed here. So we don't put, we don't want to put the shoes that went everywhere with my, you know, with myself. Even to the places of sin. I don't know. We don't want to put that up here and mix, mix it around. We want to keep this place consecrated and dedicated. And, and a lot of people, and even I sometimes think, that's just a formality. However, if we really believe that God is in this place, and if we want to really revere Him, that is just one sample, even in your life, you yourselves. I believe that God has consecrated your body and your life. Then we need to, re we need to learn to respect that. The Ark of the Covenant does not need my Uza, my strength. We need the strength from the Ark of the Covenant. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6. When they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. 1 Chronicles 13, 9 through 10, we read, God's anger, the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and he struck him down. If on that cart, was a burning furnace with boiling lava inside. And the oxen upset it, and it's about to fall over. Would Uzzah have held, held the furnace so that it doesn't fall over? Now the story, the, the intention and the story changes, right? <coughs> we used to say, who would not hold on to that ark? But if Uzzah understood the presence of God and how, how awesome and fearful God is, the, if Uzzah had that reverence of God, he would have believed. Even the shaking is according to his will. We're talking about our life. We're carrying. We're transporting the, the word of God in us. Sometimes, 
some outer factor, some element causes us to tr be troubled, to, shake, to be shaken up. And, so, and we oftentimes try to use our own strength, our method, our own logic to put it back to its place. But what if that shaking was according to God's will and plan? I'm, putting, I'm trying to put a stop to what God wants to do. That's why I don't really lay, uh, lay my hand easily upon people to especially pray for their, their healing. What if my strength tries to go against God's will. When I pray for myself or for, for brothers and sisters, for their healing, I seek for God's will, for God's mercy. But before that, I pray, God, may your will be fulfilled through this sickness. If it were to give me more understanding, if it were designed to give allow me to repent. That needs to take place first before the healing takes place. If He wills it to be healed. If not, that is also up to God. Who am I to lay my hand and say, regardless of what God's will is, be healed? Who am I to say that? Of course, I'm not saying those who do that are wrong because I'm sure they're praying for God's will. <coughs> Is it my will? Is it God's will? Who's us disregarding of God's reverence, God's presence? Who's us lack of knowledge of God? Is what killed him. Now, as conclusion, what about my faith? What about your faith? Who's the center of your faith, of your life? When our faith, our relationship with God becomes unstable, we start to look for stability on our own. Just like Uzzah did. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 8. You shall not make for yourself an idol. I will stop reading there. God, continue, God continues to explain to us, idol is something that we make for ourselves. Regardless of what it is. And we Christians have a very great risk of turning God into an idol. When we use God for ourselves, this worshiping God as we worship idol. They make idols for themselves. Remember? And in the wilderness of Sinai, they wanted to go back to Egypt because Moses was not coming down. They said, we need for ourselves, we need somebody, a, a God to lead us back to Egypt. Whose purpose? <coughs> Who did, whose design? Their purpose. They just need a God figure to blame as an excuse to give them a false sense of security. Let us think about the reason why we give our time, our prayer, our offering. Let us also think about the reason why I do things, the reason why I get troubled, the reason why I become darkened in my faith. Who's the center of it all? Are we trying to use God for my benefits? Please do not take me wrong. God does bless us. God will give us all those things. But the question is, what is my intention? Is it my strength plus God's? Or is it my strength given to God? First Chronicles chapter 13, verse 3 and 4. And let us bring back the ark of our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. 
the reason why David wanted to bring back the ark was to bring back God as the center of the kingdom. But in the process, he, that was not what was reflected. And therefore, at the end of today's passage, the Ark of the Covenant remains in Obed Edom's house for three months. Obed Edom put God, the Ark of the Covenant, as a center. You know, in Abinadab, it doesn't say that Abinadab was so blessed for the 20 years he had the Ark of the Covenant. But Obed Edom, what's the difference? We can see that in the attitude of Uzzah also. King Saul, when, when Goliath, of Goliath of the Philistines army came and threatened the Israelite army, King Saul was afraid of this beast. King Saul was, did not know what to do because he was afraid. So he could not go forward with the will of God. But David came and, and said, How can you defile and blaspheme the name of the Lord? This little boy David did not look at Goliath. In the eyes of Saul, Goliath was a center. In the eyes of David, God was a center. He did not look at this big man, also like a beast. That beast is in us threatening us today. Are we trying to appease that beast like King Saul and try to go, try to find other ways to just keep that beast and then go on and act like we're still following the will of God or are we fighting against it? Will the Ark of the Covenant give us life or death? That's a big question. King Saul used the Ark of the Covenant like a lucky charm. Every time he went out to the battle, he brought out the Ark of the Covenant because that's the only way to defeat the enemy. Are we using God like a genie in a bottle? Bring it out when we need it. God didn't like it. That's why the Ark of the Covenant found his way away from Israel. Now David is calling him back. Today, let us call the presence of God back into the center of our lives. Let us not treat him like Uzzah did, but let us recognize who he is. In your home, in your life, this word, where do you keep this Bible? In your car? In your bag? Where do you keep this Bible? It needs to be at least in the physical position on top of everything else. Don't put other things on top of it. If you really revere God, this represents the presence of God, uh, the name of God. I'm not saying this is, you know, some divine thing. The content, the spirit that is in it is. At least we need to change our lives to recognize the presence of God. Not in things, but in our life. Where is he today? Where is he today? Who's that? You know, Apostle Paul said in, in Second Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, 1 Corinthians 9, 26, he says, I don't want to be boxing in the air. Right? He doesn't want his prayers, his, his life of faith, to be just going through the motions. If you're just going through the motions, whether you hit or, some, or, or, or something or not, you don't realize. You just go through the motions. Is that our life of faith? Do we just go through the motions whether God is there or not? Or do we recognize whether God is there or not? When you pray, do you really feel like God is there? And sometimes not there? Have you ever been on the phone? You're talking to your friend or your, the other person at the, end, uh, in the other line. And then, and then the phone got hung up, got disconnected, but you don't realize that you've been talking for about two minutes, and then no response. Hello? Hello? And you don't realize why it was disconnected. Is that like our prayer? 
Is our prayer really, really a conversation with God, or is it just, you know, speaking to the air? Is our life, when we serve God in the church, are we really serving God, or are we doing just giving service or doing going through the motions to fill up the time so the pastor might see me serving? Is it real? Is our life of faith real? Uzzah just was going through the motions. Do you find God in this world? I pray that our church, everyone, will be able to find real God in your life, in this world, rather than just go through the motions and act like God is in that box. God was there. And Uzzah and everyone realized God is alive. Let us believe that even before Perez Uza takes place. I pray that Zion Church is a place where God is alive. Amen. Your life, may your life be a life where God is alive. Amen. Let us be able to find and detect His presence and respect His presence. That is called reverence. Let us pray. <laughs>